Um, so I just want to thank everybody for joining us this evening um, for our highlights of Rio de Janeiro with tour guide Aline Scott Plavnik, 2009. My name is Laura Wills and I'm the Associate Director of Alumni Relations. Uh, I just want to mention that I am recording this webinar for those who are unable to join us at this time so that they can watch it later. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, we'll have time about halfway through her presentation and again at the end. You can either type your question into the chat box for me to read to her or indicate to me in the chat box that you'd like to ask a question and I'll unmute you so you can ask the question yourself. I am so excited to participate in this tour since we can't travel at this time. Uh, Rio de Janeiro is the most famous city in Brazil and it offers something for all ages and interests such as nature, history, architecture, and beaches. Aline will lead us tonight on a virtual tour to show us why Rio's nickname is the Marvelous City. She and I chatted earlier today during our little test run and she said, it's not fair, I only have an hour to talk about Rio. <laughs> so Aline is from Brazil. She was an international student who attended Dickinson on the Asbel Global Campus Scholarship and abroad in Australia. And she was a biology major and was involved with she the Portuguese Club, Alpha Phi Omega, the STEP team, and the Asbel Center. But it was her experience as, as a Liberty Caps tour guide and international orientation volunteer that she was able to draw on when she began working with tourism eight years ago. So besides the famous attractions such as Christ the Redeemer and the Sugarloaf Cable Car, which are included tonight, um, she loves sharing the beauties of Rio and the experiences that only locals know. Um, when tourism came to a complete halt due to COVID, Aline started offering virtual tours as a way to continue working through the pandemic. And she's graciously um, letting us travel with her this evening. So with that, Aline, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. Good evening, everyone. For those who just entered, uh, good evening as well. As Laura said, my name is Aline. I'm a 2009 grad and I have my Dickinson alumni water bottle here where I'm ready to go. <laughs> I'm so, so happy to be here. Thank you so much, Laura, for inviting me and allowing me to show my work here for you and uh, be able to bring some joy to your day, to your evening, since we're not able to travel right now. So as Laura said, I am a full-time certified tour guide here in Rio. And I've been working in tourism for eight years. I did work with biology. That was my major for a little bit. And then I switched to tourism and uh, I'm, I'm just, I love it. <laughs> so, and Rio is the perfect city in Brazil to work with tourism. So I'm very grateful to be here today. And thank you everyone for taking your time tonight to be here with me. So I'm going to start sharing here my screen so you can see a little bit of, of Rio. Okay, so can everyone hear me and see the screen? How is it, Laura? All good? It is good. Okay, okay. So as, uh, as I said before, I've been working in tourism for eight years. I have my contacts here. It's not hard to find me, Aline Tour Guide on Instagram or Facebook, but I will repeat my contacts towards the end of the tour so that you can find me online and we can uh, uh, interact via email or any other social media platform. Uh, also, I wanted to say that because of this pandemic, it's been quite a challenge, right? I'm a people's person, as you probably may have, may have noticed since uh, I work with tourism, I love talking to people. So it's been quite a challenging time. It's been almost nine months at home and tourism um, has been uh, struggling for quite some time now. So hopefully after all of this is over, you can take all this information that I share with you today and plan a future trip to Brazil and to Rio and contact me and make these Dickinson connections that will be wonderful. <laughs> so let's start here with a little bit of an intro of Brazil. So if you don't know the country, we are the largest country in South America. 
and we are the fifth largest country in the world continentally and in population. So we have 200, over 210 Bra million Brazilians um, that live here in this amazing, huge country. It's a very diverse, very multicultural country. Uh, although it is the largest Catholic country in the world just by because of the amount of people. And um, we are a very tropical country as well, very diverse country, as I said. And if we look a little bit closer, we will see that Brazil is divided into states. So this one outlined in uh, red is the Rio state, Rio de Janeiro state. So just so you don't get confused, uh, we have a situation similar to New York, New York, where the city and the state have the same name. So we're in the state of Rio de Janeiro and the capital is the city of Rio de Janeiro. And we have 26 states in Brazil plus the federal district, which is where Brasilia is our uh, capital of the country. It's not Rio, it's Brasilia. But a lot of people get it confused because our city was the capital for almost 200 years until 1960 when the capital was moved to Brasilia. So uh, we were the capital from the beginning of the 19th century until 1960, almost 200 years. And so a lot of important uh, historical moments for Brazil happened here in our city, which is really amazing if you like history. Uh, it's something that you can explore here in Rio as well. And if we look a little bit closer, so we see Brazil is uh, bathed by the Atlantic Ocean. We have um, many, many beautiful beaches as you probably can uh, imagine. We actually have what is voted the number one most beautiful beach in the world, uh, according to TripAdvisor. It's in Fernando de Noronha, which is an island off of the coast here. And we also have here in Rio, one of the uh, top most beautiful beach in Brazil. So we have over 5,000 miles of coast and the coast of the state of Rio de Janeiro is also very beautiful. We have Caribbean like beaches in some parts, not too far from the city here. And as you can tell here, it's a small state. We have 18 million people in the state. And in the city of Rio de Janeiro, we have 7 million people. So we, we are the second largest city in the country, uh, followed just by Sao Paulo city. So Sao Paulo is not far from here. It's a 40 minute uh, plane ride, and, but it's inland, so it doesn't have coast. So we say Rio is cooler because we have the coast, we have the beaches, we have this city here. So the outline in red is the city of Rio de Janeiro. It's actually quite spread out. And what we usually see in TV and movies is just this part here. So the bottom right corner of the city, which is the most touristic area of Rio, where we have the Christ, the Sugarloaf, and the famous beaches and everything else that we're going to see today. But if you notice here on the right side, we have a bay, right, that goes inward. And this bay is called Guanabara Bay, part of the city, uh, sits around this bay and grew around the bay. On the other side of the bay, we have our sister city called Niteroi. And we have many parts of Rio where we have beautiful view of this bay. And we're gonna talk a, a little bit more about it in just a little bit. But our city itself is uh, 800 square miles. So as you can probably imagine, it's quite spread out. So we don't usually take tourists everywhere. Some parts are, uh, not very uh, pleasant to walk around. Unfortunately, uh, Brazil is a developing country and we do have a lot of slums here in Rio, uh, but it is a city where you can uh, tour around and you can travel and you can have fun in a safe way. So we are going to start with an intro video just to give you a little taste of what we'll see today.
Just a second. Let me pause it and go back a little bit. I think because of the admitting here, someone go back a little bit. Okay. So let's fly into oh, a little bit loud. Let's fly into Rio. There is the Sugarloaf, the famous beaches, the Christ on top of the mountain. And we have this very unique combination of the mountains shooting up from the ocean and the city spread out in the middle of all of this. We have islands off of our coast and we're going to explore a little bit of all of this. So our first stop here in the city is actually on the west part of, of Rio. So this is just another map to um, get a better idea, give you a better idea of the layout of the city. So that red um, outline that I showed you is kind of all of this. And to the right here, we have the Guanabara Bay, right? So. The way we divide the city, we have the south part of Rio, which is this part where Copacabana and the famous Ipanema are. We have the north part of the city, which is where the international airport is. It's the most spread out area and also the most poor area of Rio. We have the downtown area, which is this part right here, which is the historical and financial district all squeezed into one place. So we have a very interesting mixture of old and new buildings all in the same area. We have the West, which is with what we call this part here where we have this huge, almost 10 mile long beach. And we have the East, which is the ocean and Niterói city. So the other side of the bay. So we're gonna start in uh, at the West and we're gonna make our way up to the, the city center and to the South. So the first is this stop here, this Telegraph Rock. Uh, maybe you haven't heard of it, but it is one of the most photographed, Instagrammed places in all of Rio right now. So this is actually a trail and Rio is very popular for hiking, for trails and actually also for rock climbing. And as you saw all of those mountains, and this is a very popular one because of this picture. So this is not me, it's a friend of mine. He lent me his picture, um, but it, this is actually a, a photographic illusion. And this has become very, very popular. So this trail is about 45 minutes to an hour. And this is in an area of the city, as I said, the west part where we have the wild beaches. So these are all environmentally protected areas. Uh, some of them you have to also take a trail to arrive at these beaches, but these are all untouched and they're quite beautiful. So let's look at what this trail looks like to arrive to the top of the Telegraph Rock. So this is the west part of Rio. Look at the color of this water is really amazing. Uh, not so uh, high buildings, smaller houses, more simple. And this is where we start the trail. So you'll probably see it's very easy trail. Um, people of all ages can do it. It's uh, pretty straightforward, but there's actually a mistake here during this trail. Uh, it's uh, freezing a little bit, hold on, okay. 
Let me go back just a little. It skipped a part here. So here, um, this, <laughs> let me try again. The telegraph rock is actually another rock, is not the one that was showing in the picture. And I'm gonna tell you why in just a little bit. It's freezing here, the image for my video, just a moment. Let me go back. Okay, I think I got it. Might be a bit heavy. So I'm just gonna continue from this part. Let's see if it works. So there's another rock on the way to the pointy one that you saw on the picture um, that, was, that is actually called the telegraph rock. This, this uh, rock that you see here where people are lining up to take the photo this is called the anvil rock. So why is it telegraph rock? Because there was a military post uh, around the World War II here by that rock, the other one, where um, there was a lookout point with the telegraph to watch for German submarines that would try to attack the Brazilian coast. So this is why it's called telegraph rock. And this is the tip here of why we have that photographic illusion. We have about five feet here of height um, and another rock underneath. So you're not actually gonna fall. <laughs> you can take the picture as if you were falling just like this and uh, you don't fall. <laughs> and there's the back, there's all the people lined up waiting to go. This is pre-pandemic and this is the anvil rock. And you can see the shape of the anvil here. Right now, it's uh, not as busy and people will have to wear masks, so not a lot of people are going. But there is a tip to arrive there and have it just for yourself, and I'm going to show it in just a minute. So this is it right here. The best time to go is to watch the sunrise. And this is a picture of another tour guide, a friend of mine who sent me, who is specialized in this trail. And he just, he does just this. He takes people up for sunrise where the rock is completely empty and you don't have to line up. Sometimes people wait for like an hour, an hour and a half just to take this picture. So if you want, don't want to do that, the pro tip is to go for sunrise. But of course you have to go with a tour guide that knows the way because you're gonna do it um, at, the, at dark. So it's uh, not advisable to go on your own. So the next stop up, we're moving towards the east, towards the south part of the city. So we were just here on this tip and we crossed the entire Baja beach. So this area here is called Baja da Tijuca, where we have the longest beach of Rio is about 10 miles. And we're going to São Conrado beach where you have paragliding and hang gliding at Pedra Bonita. So Pedra Bonita means beautiful rock. And I'm gonna show you what this looks like. This is actually a very popular thing to do here in Rio and you do it inside the city. So the beautiful rock is this one right here. And we have this humongous, oddly shaped rock here. And this is Gavia rock. And as you can see, I'm gonna to move to the next one. This is Gavia rock. And this is over 2,300 feet high above sea level. And all of these mountains here in Rio are a specific kind of granite formation called Gneiss. So this is a very slowly formed over millions of years uh, kind of granite. And uh, from what we study here in tourism, this kind of rock formation is the same kind that you find in South Africa. Because back in the day when everything was just one continent, Pangea, um, Africa and Brazil were stuck together. 
And specifically, the height of where Rio de Janeiro is, is about where South Africa is. And when the tectonic plates started dividing and the Atlantic Ocean started forming, these uh, mountains started forming in both sides. So I've never been to South Africa. If you have, let me know, tell me if the mountains are similar, but this is what people say. I still have to go and check it out for myself. Uh, but this is Gavia Rock. This is not where we um, jump for hang gliding and paragliding. It's actually the, this rock right next to it. Pedra Bonita, so it's about 2,300 feet. And uh, the, the flight ramp is actually this little piece here is a little bit lower. So let me show you here what this looks like. This is also something I haven't done yet, just like the telegraph rock, it's something that's on my list, I still have to get there. But this is the way up and this is where you arrive on the ramp. It's a beautiful day today. This is the view from the ramp. And unless you are certified, you have to fly with a professional instructor. So um, this is the air shot of what the ramp looks like. Let me go back. <laughs> so on one side is paragliding, on the other, si the other side is hang gliding. And so there are separate parts of the ramp. And on the bottom, you have the paragliding. So this is a famous blogger here in Rio, and we're going to see his flights today. This flight usually takes about 10, 13 minutes, maybe a little bit less, depending on the wind conditions. And you fly over the mountains, this green area that I'm going to talk about in just a little bit. You see Gavia Rock. This is, the, this is it right here. It has this weird flat top that some people say it's because of uh, some extraterrestrial activity. <laughs> we don't know if it's true or not. And you also get to fly over the water. So this is really beautiful. This is São Conrado area. And when you land, you can land here on the grass or sometimes you land on the So let me explain to you a little bit about uh, all this green area that we saw. Um, that covers the mountains here, right? So this all is part of two national parks that cover 17% of the city of Rio. So remember we were here at the tip where the telegraph rock is. This is part of one national park, this uh, green area to the left. And then we have this other green area to the right where we were just now right here on this area here. This is São Conrado Beach, and this is Tijuca National Park. So both of these national parks together make up 17% of the area of Rio. And this line, this yellow line, is actually a trail called Transcarioca Trail that is 112 miles long. So if you like trail and hiking, Rio is a great city for you, as I said before, if you like radical sports as well, but I'll show you that Rio has something to offer to everyone, as I said. And this is actually uh, quite an interesting story because uh, this part here, this national park to the right, is actually all replanted area. So let me show you this uh, image here. This is a painting by a, a famous French painter that visited Brazil in the 18th, 17th, 18th century. And he uh, pictured uh, what he witnessed in the day-to-day -day basis. So what he is painting here is actually uh, the cutting down of the trees of the forest that used to exist where you see a forest now. So this forest was all cut down to plant coffee. And um, I don't know if everyone knows this, but Brazil is, was the largest colony of Portugal. That's why Brazil speaks Portuguese. We were the only a Portuguese colonized uh, country here in South America. And we were the largest colony. So when they arrived here in the year 1500 and they realized this was a tropical fertile land, uh, they could plant things here that were very valuable in Europe and that were very hard to grow. 
So we had different cycles of different products. The first one was sugarcane, and then we had also rubber. And later on, we had coffee. And coffee plantations were very popular here in Rio. And I don't know if you know this, but up to nowadays, uh, coffee is, um, Brazil is the largest exporter of coffee in the world. So if you like coffee, try Brazilian coffee as well here when you come. So this forest was all cut down, the native forest was all cut down to plant coffee. So we have another uh, painting here of him of the coffee plantations. But throughout time, as any kind of monoculture, the coffee started drying out the soil, weakening the soil, sucking up all the nutrients in the water, and consequently drying up all the, the river springs that existed in the forest. This started creating a water supply problem in the city because all the water that arrived there came from the forest. So the emperor at the time, we were a, a, an emperor empire at a certain period here in Brazil, the emperor at the time realized this uh, issue and ordered at the end of the 19th century, all the coffee plantations to be cut down, everything to be stopped and to replant the entire forest. So this started in 1860. They uh, took 13 years replanting over 100,000 different species of plants and trees native from Brazil and also from other parts of the world that were brought by the Portuguese. And thus we have nowadays this very luscious forest and national park that you saw in the paragliding flight and that you will see again um, in other attractions as well. So it's really amazing for me, at least, that I still have a, a biology heart and I love the plants and the trees. So that's helped me a lot with my tour guiding. And it's really amazing to see how from 1860 to now, this has grown back to be a very, very luscious forest. And because of the forest being replanted, we had uh, the return of the wild animals. So here are some examples of the animals that we have here in, in the city. Uh, that you can see like the slots and toucans, many tropical birds. If you like bird watching, the state of Rio is, um, has been voted one of the best in the world for bird watching. We have about 25% of the species of birds in Brazil that are only endemic here to the state of Rio. And we have different species of monkeys as well. We're, we'll see a few of them uh, right now. So we have this little fella here. This is the capuchin monkey. And this was shot in the botanic garden. And we'll see another one in a little bit. So you'll find them sometimes in the Christ, Sugarloaf, inside the national park if you visit. And something that's very amazing is that if it wasn't for the replantation of this forest, our city could be up to 40 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than it already gets. So I'm sure that you've heard about Rio being a very hot uh, city in the summer. We get temperatures of up, up to 100, 110, 120 Fahrenheit. So they could be even hotter if it wasn't for this national park, this forest. So we're very thankful and it's a privilege to have this forest in the middle of our city and it helps regulate the temperature. So here's the name of the forest, so you'd remember, Chijuca Forest. And now we're going to visit another spot inside the forest called the Chinese View. And it's one of my favorite views of all the cities. So it's right here, very close to the hang gliding and paragliding. So let me show you another way to drive into the forest. And you can go by car. Right now it's not allowed because of the pandemic, only walking in the forest. But usually you can drive into the forest and we have this very luscious forest to explore. We have picnic areas, like I said, many hiking and um, walking areas. And we also have, let me show you what's next, um, over a hundred year old trees. This, this is the centennial tree area. And we have waterfalls as well. Sometimes technology wins over us. <laughs> Let me try to go back a little bit just to show you the waterfall.
There we go. So the waterfalls are great for a very hot summer day when the, the beaches are super busy, some of them that you are able to get into. So it's a shot from this waterfall from the top, which is beautiful. And look at this luscious forest. And this is another animal that we find here, native from South America. This is the Quachi. It's a mammal with this very long nose. And if you've been to the Iguazu Falls, you'll recognize them because they're very popular there as well. They usually are, uh, they usually live in these big groups, so big families. They're very cheeky as well, just like the capuchin monkeys that we saw before. <laughs> but they're usually not, not aggressive. They're just very curious and they know that humans have um, food. <laughs> it's usually we're not you know, allowed to give them food. But going back to the Chinese view, so let's keep driving up the forest. Let me try to go back a little bit again. Sorry, everyone. It worked for us earlier today, it didn't it? <laughs> it did, yeah. Sometimes it's technology is cheeky too. Let's try again. There we go. This is the view you get from the Chinese view. So you get the Christ here, and we're going to see a little bit closer um, in a little bit. We have a Sugarloaf Mountain all the way in the back. This here, this water is the lagoon, Rodrigo de Freitas Lagoon. This is a natural water. This is the horse race tracks here. And this green area here is the botanical garden. It's one of the largest ones in South America. It's also very beautiful. And we have the Chinese pagoda here. So why do we have a Chinese pagoda in the middle of the forest in Rio? Well, this was also during um, the colonial period here in Brazil. Uh, they tried to plant tea here in Rio to compete with the Chinese tea because it was very popular. So it was an experiment done here by the em emperor and uh, he um, imported some Chinese workers and they lived right around this area where the Chinese pagoda is. So the, the pagoda is an homage to them. Unfortunately, the, uh, this story doesn't end very well. <laughs> the, the Brazilian tea was not very popular. It didn't sell because it had no taste at all. It grew well, but it had no taste. So not a very good experiment. But this is what they did back in the day. They just did trial and error. And this is one of my favorite spots in Rio. So let me stop sharing. So we have a video number two. I hope it behaves a little bit better. <laughs> um, do we have any questions so far? I wasn't able to check the chat. The only question I see so far is John's wondering what your weather's like in Rio right now. Right now it's raining, but it's warm. So it's about a, between 80s and 90s, something like this around 80s. So nice. um, December is when it starts getting really hot. End of November, beginning of December, it'll start getting really, really warm. And then it's amazingly warm and humid in January and February. It feels kind of like Florida. <laughs> it's very similar. Uh, if you've been there, you're constantly sweating. You know, you take a cold shower, you get out of the shower and you start sweating again. Uh, but right now we're in the spring. So spring, sometimes we have rainy weather. Sometimes it's sunny. It could go up to 90 or close to 100. So in a few days, hopefully it'll get better. <laughs> and someone said it keeps breaking up. Were you able to hear me overall so far? I was I able to. Okay, good. I, I think just the video was, yep. was a bit heavy. <laughs> All right. Anyone has any other questions? from what we saw so far? None that have typed in and no one's indicating. All right, so let's go to part two. Let me open it here.
just a moment. <laughs> Do you know the name of the blue bird on the bottom right from the, yes, it's a very beautiful bird. It's one of my favorites. Um, in Portuguese, it's called Saída. I can check the name for you at the end if you want. Um, I think it's Tanager, something like Tanager. It's a seven color Tanager, I guess, would be the translation that comes up to mind right now. <laughs> But yes, it's very beautiful. I've seen it at the Christ and in the botanical gardens. I've, I've spotted them. They're, they're quite small. They're like this big. The red one is, is really tricky to see as well. Um, it's like blood red tanager, something like this. It flies very quickly. It's impossible to get a picture from him. <laughs> all right, so let's see how this goes now. The, all right, so that was the question before, okay. Let's try again. I missed the part with the alien activity. <laughs> so the area is uh, the Gavia rock. So let me write it for you. It is Gavia rock. So it's um, one single piece of a mountain and the largest single piece of rock by the ocean in the world. So it's uh, over, it's about 2,500 feet high. Someone else also asked, so we have some questions now. <laughs> How long is a flight from the US? So depending where in the US you're coming from, uh, from New York, let's say to here, it's about 10, 11 hours, something like this. Uh, if you're flying from further north a little bit, could be 12. We do have some direct flights, but uh, I've gone through Atlanta, through DC, uh, JFK, those are the ones that do direct flights to Rio or Sao Paulo. Right now, because of the pandemic, um, they're only allowing people to fly to Sao Paulo and then from Sao Paulo to Rio. But you are able to come right now if you want. <laughs> Some people have uh, already started adventuring themselves coming to Rio. It's uh, not a bad idea, actually. I mean, yeah, it's hard to talk about this, right? Because uh, you, you get the touristic attractions are much emptier. Not everything is open, but most things are already. Uh, I would say about 95% of the touristic attractions are already open. Christ and Sugarloaf reopened in August. And some of the other ones that I'll show you have reopened already. The only thing that's not back um, yet are the museums. Some cultural centers are still closed. Some are already open by appointment, so you have to schedule it online ahead of time. Uh, but most of things are open. So we've seen some tourists around, some international tourists. And I uh, sometimes uh, try to talk to them. Hey, where are you from? How did you get here? <laughs> I'm really curious to know. <laughs> so we found this out. So most people that are coming from the US are flying through Sao Paulo. But right now, the borders are closed for Brazilians to go into the US, in case you're wondering. So we're not able to fly to the US right now. Borders are closed and they're not allowing us there. <laughs> um, if we're having large spike in COVID infections right now. So my opinion is that we, is that we never left the first wave. Um, as opposed to other countries in Europe, for example, um, Europe, most European countries were able to control the first wave very well, and then now the second wave is being worse. Here in Rio, in the city of Rio, so each state here in Brazil has worked differently, just like in, in the US, it's such a big country that each state and each city has been behaving a little bit different. In Rio, our first wave was terrible, and the peak was around June, May or June. Uh, but we are seeing um, the um, cases slowly rising again, but not as not as bad as some uh, U.S. cities that I've followed um, through the news. Um, we did have elections this past weekend, and a lot of people went out to vote for mayor and for uh, city council. So. Some people are saying that 
we are seeing the numbers spike a little bit more because of this, you know, it's a consequence. And also because at least here in the city of Rio, our mayor just before elections, um, up until like uh, two months before elections, he, he was still forbidding people to stay on the beach. So you were allowed to walk on the sand, go in the water, uh, just for a swim or walk by the sidewalk, but you were not allowed to lay on the sand and, and suntan. So people are really pissed about it. And then like a month and a half before elections, of course, he's not dumb. He just said, everything is allowed. Everything's free for everyone. And just go back to your normal lives and <laughs> do anything you want. And basically, so he could get more votes. So <laughs> I think this, what we're seeing now is the consequence of that, but people are becoming aware of this slow rise of the um, numbers again. Uh, we do have a second wave in some other states in Brazil. So the south of Brazil, for example, the first part, the first wave, they were able to control it very, very well. And now they are hitting the second wave very badly. So it, does change a lot from state to state and from big, you know, from capital to capital. So Gavia Rock, yeah. So the alien thing is in Gavia Rock has this flat top, looks like someone cut it on the top. And on the top, if you uh, search for the, the uh, picture of this rock, it looks like someone carved a face on top of the rock. So some people say that, you know, some emperor from back in the day had some, alien activity, their contact maybe, and carve this face on top of this 2,500 feet tall rock. <laughs> but, you know, these legends, urban legends. All right, so let me see if this is better now. Okay, so is everyone seeing the map? All right, so Going back to our tour around Rio, we are going to Maracana Stadium and we are here on this red dot. So the Maracana Stadium, let me see if I can start the video. All right, got it. <laughs> um, this stadium was built for the first World Cup that we held here in Brazil in 1950. So Brazil has hosted two World Cups, 1950 and 2014. And this uh, amazing stadium holds around 80,000 people. It was all renovated for the Olympics and the World Cup actually. So this is a little bit of what it looks like on the inside. And it's uh, very important for Brazilians and South Americans in general because we are soccer fans. And as I usually say, um, soccer is the number one religion in Brazil. <laughs> so I have some pictures here of myself uh, in the Maracana Stadium. This was the World Cup final. I was working for Coca-Cola back in the day. And then this is the Olympics uh, opening ceremony that I worked for uh, an American company called uh, Jet Set Sports and Co-Sport. So uh, right next to the Maracana, and actually not right next, but very close. So the Maracana Stadium is here and the Samba Drome is here. So we have the Samba Drome, which houses the Brazilian carnival, the famous carnival that we see uh, on TV. But before I talk about the carnival, something I wanna mention about the Maracana Stadium is that a lot of famous world renowned singers have sung in the Ma in Maracana, like Frank Sinatra and Madonna. And if you watch the Queen movie, that famous big concert is, was inside the Maracana Stadium. So that was a very uh, big moment in the Maracana history, the Queen concert there. So going back to the Samba Drome, this is the Mecca of the Samba and the Carnival in Rio. So this is what it looks like, the venue itself. It was built in the 80s, but the, the parade started way before that. It was in the main avenue here in Rio. This um, sits about 70,000 people, but we also have, besides the official Carnival Parade, we have Street Carnival, which are free and open to everyone. So Carnival in Rio is the busiest time for us. 
and it brings in so some samba for you guys <laughs> um it brings in two million extra people into the city so let's uh, take a look at some of the highlights of this year's winner of the parade. So I have the carnival floats with special effects. We had a mermaid here in the opening float. She was a swimmer from the synchronized swim team. So these are what the floats look like. We have famous people that are invited to join the parade so that they can bring more points. This is a very serious business for everyone here in Rio. And it's a, like an industry and it brings in a lot of um, money. So let me try to go back here so you can listen to the drum section which is the heart of the carnival parade. And the um, instruments that you'll see that are used in carnival mainly came from um, African slaves that were brought to Brazil throughout slavery. So if you don't know, uh, Brazil was the country that received the most slaves in the world, even more so than the US. And it's estimated that about 4 million people, either four or five, we're not sure because uh, people uh, didn't use to keep documents for slaves. So it's an estimate about 4 million people arrived to Brazil throughout the 200 plus years of slavery that we had here to work in the plantations and the coffee plantations and the sugarcane plantations. So with that, we have nowadays a very, very rich Afro-Brazilian culture, including music, but not just music. We have the influence in food, in history, everything. So carnival is part of that because the drum and the rhythms come from African drums and African rhythms that were brought by the, the people that were enslaved muito, here. Muito bem so this was the winner this year, this uh, samba group called Viradouro. Let me try to, okay, I think now I got it. Essa bateria é a bateria que tem mais mulheres, tem 45 mulheres na bateria. A little bit slow. See the drums. Agora em Prota, à frente do quarto carro da escola, a ciranda de roda à beira do mar aberto. A Margarete Menezes aí à frente desse carro, olha, estrela do carnaval baiano. So just to give you a little taste, but this is a serious business here in Brazil, at the busiest time for us in tourism. And um, carnival in Rio is actually in the Guinness Book of Records as the largest spectacle on earth. So I always say to everyone, you have to come and watch it at least once in your life because it is something that is very hard to describe. It has so many details. It's part of a culture. It's also a competition. So you have to you know, talk about the themes of each parade and they change every year and so on. So I recommend it strongly, highly recommend it for you to do it. Not next year, because we're not sure if it's gonna happen because of the uh, vaccine. We're waiting for the vaccine to come out. But this was me this year with a group in the winner's parade. <laughs> so very close to the Samba Drone, we have the port area. So this top part here of the city center where we have the Olympic Boulevard that was all renovated for the Olympics in 2016. And we have brand new touristic attractions in this area. The first one is the Rio Star, which is a Ferris wheel, is the largest one in South America now. And it's really, really brand new because it was opened in December. So it's been, uh, it was more time uh, closed than open, unfortunately, because of the pandemic. But now they're back up and running, which is really cool. Right next door to the Rio Star Ferris wheel, we have the Marine Aquarium of Rio, which is called the Aqua Rio. Also the largest aquarium in South America. This is what it looks like. 
And as you can see, uh, it's right next door to the Ferris wheel. The Ferris wheel is right behind it. And it has very, very cool features. It's a very cool aquarium. But I wanted to show you the special feature of the aquarium, which is the marine tank where you go underneath the water. And this tank has over 3 million liters of marine water that's from the coast here of Rio. So we have sharks, we have rays, we have Brazilian species and also species from other parts of the world. Many of them were rescued, so if you're wondering. Uh, many of them were born here in the aquarium, which is really cool. Moving along a little bit more down the Olympic Boulevard, we have the largest graffiti wall in the world, which is called Ethnicities, and it was done by a famous Brazilian graffiti artist called Cobra. I'm sure you've heard of him. And he has this very characteristic, very colorful outlines and uh, geometrical shapes. This is the Ethnicities mural. It took him two and a half months working 12 hours a day with some help but it has 8,000 square feet. And it's in the Guinness Book of Records as well. It's actually now the second largest graffiti wall in the world because Cobra himself broke his own record and uh, did a bigger one, but it's in Sao Paulo and not as beautiful. <laughs> so I usually say this is the most beautiful one and the largest one. The idea behind it is, as the name, name says, um, ethnicities. So um, he depicted an ethnic group, a native group, one from each continent. And this was actually commissioned by the Olympic Committee. So um, his idea, uh, he was inspired by the five Olympic rings in the Olympic flag and the idea of unity and brotherhood and that we all come from the natives. Uh, so we have here uh, on the left, the first one is an African tribe. The second one is an Asian tribe. The middle one is an Amazon tribe here from Brazil, the Tapajós. Then we have a Lapland tribe representing Europe. And the last one is a Papua New Guinea tribe from Oceania. So this is really amazing. It's a brand new touristic attraction. It's only four years old and there's Cobra. And he has murals all over the world. I, I uh, brought one here from New York. This, uh, he did this one in 2018 uh, in honor of Michael Jackson. If he was alive, he would have turned 60. So he did this mural, but there's many murals from Cobra spread all over the world, uh, not just New York, but he has some in Miami, he has one in Amsterdam, in Japan, many other parts of Europe as well. So when you see this kind of graffiti, it's probably Cobra. So the next one very close to the Cobra mural is the Museum of Tomorrow. Maybe you've heard of it and it's very close here. So this is all walking distance. And the Museum of Tomorrow is this funny uh, shaped uh, building here that you saw in the opening uh, video. So you might recognize the architecture because this was designed by famous uh, Spanish architect called Santiago Calatrava. And he was the same architect that designed the Oculus in New York. So he has this very modern, different architecture. And this is right in the middle of the Olympic Boulevard. And as you can see, this is all brand new. There used to be a bridge that uh, was right over here that was taken down to renovate this area. So the idea is to renovate the entire port area of Rio to have something similar as in Buenos Aires where they have Puerto Madero and they were very successful in renovating that entire area. In the back here, we have this huge bridge that's over seven miles long that connects the city of Rio to the city on the other side of the bay called Niteroi. But look at this shape here of the Museum of Tomorrow. This was inaugurated 2015, so it's brand new as well. And um, the architect said he was inspired by a flower of a bromeliad. So if you look from the top, this long shape, but you can you know, call it anything. I've heard people call it whale skeleton or something like this. 
Uh, but something very cool about this building is because it's a science museum that talks about tomorrow and the future, the idea is that you are thinking about the next 50 years in this planet and what we do now affects our future in uh, planet Earth. So it's really cool. It's all interactive, very innovative, but also the building itself was made so it's LEED certified. Um, I was telling Laura that I remembered when I heard about the LEED certification of the Museum of Tomorrow, and I remembered some of the uh, Dickinson buildings are LEED certified as well, which is really cool. Uh, it has these wings in the outer part that are actually solar panels that change the shape and change, uh, change from up-down uh, positions to um, attract more sunlight and to allow more sunlight to go into the museum. It also captures rainwater uh, and also captures the bay water. So this water that we see here around the museum is the bay. Unfortunately, the Guanabara Bay is polluted, but the museum helps with it by capturing water from the bay, filters it, uses it for the AC and returns it clean to the bay. So it's really cool. So the next um, stop is uh, something that you may have heard of. It's actually the third most popular attraction in Rio after Christ and Sugarloaf. It's the Celeron Stairs. So we've moved from this port part up to the city center, the downtown area. And who was Celeron? Celeron was this guy here. He was an artist from Chile, a painter. He traveled the whole world with his art. When he arrived in Rio for the first time in the 90s, he fell in love with Rio and he moved here. So he lived on one of these houses and he decided to do a mosaic of tiles to decorate the front of his house. He became obsessed with this project and he decided to do the entire stairs. So as he started becoming popular with this project, people started sending him tiles from all over the world. So we have over 2000 tiles from over 60 countries. We do have some, some tiles that were hand painted by Celeron himself. Unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago. There's a picture of him hanging out on the stairs. He really loved Brazil. He loved his artwork. He said it was a fluid artwork. And here we have some tiles and you have to really pay attention to them. And I'll show you some of them, but the steps became very, very popular because of this video clip with Snoop Dogg and Pharrell from the song Beautiful. So if you go and watch the video clip, you'll see that it was all shot here in Rio, especially on the Celeron stairs. So that's when it became super popular. So I brought here some photos of some um, tiles here from some of your home states or cities maybe. So we have New York here, we have Georgia, we have Don't Mess With Texas. Philadelphia, San Francisco. So we have also here Alaska, LA, Chicago, Ohio, London, and then many, many other countries. We have a very random funny one, which is the Mona Lisa. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> and also another one of my favorites, the Africa continent. These are all tiles, which is really cool. Someone probably sent it to him as a gift. So now we have to talk about the beaches, right? So we can't talk about Rio without talking about the beaches. We have over 20 beaches here in Rio, but I'm sure uh, the most famous ones and the ones that you've heard about are Copacabana and Ipanema. So this pink highlighted area here is Copacabana and Ipanema is right next to it. It's actually just this area, but we see that we have a long beach here these are actually two beaches, but it's the same stretch of sand. So we have Ipanema here, and right next to it, we have Leblon. So this is where uh, the girl from Ipanema was written. Yes. <laughs> so let's look at what they look like a little bit. Look how beautiful. Copacabana has about two and a half miles, and this is where we um, hold the largest New Year's event of Brazil which is the New Year's fireworks here on Copacabana Beach. It attracts between two to three million people every year. This year, it's probably not gonna happen because of the vaccine not coming out, but there is a Sugarloaf Mountain. That's where we're going next. And this is uh, Ipanema here, the lagoon that you saw before. 
there's the Christ on top of a mountain. And let's look at what Ipanema looks like from the bottom. So this is the view from Ipanema Beach. All the way back there, you saw the rock with the flat top. There's Gavia Rock. This other one right in front of that uh, is the Two Brothers Mountain. And look at this Caribbean looking water. This is Ipanema. And this was actually during the pandemic <laughs> that I shot. Uh, but people in Rio love the sun. So it's a sunny Sunday, they go to the beach. This is also a very popular spot to watch the sunset in Rio and it's a free spot. And uh, so this is what it looks like usually with the outline of the mountains, it's very beautiful. So the next up we have the Sugarloaf the second most popular touristic attraction of Rio. It's very close to Copacabana, as you can see. And it's this mountain that goes into the mouth of the bay. So what is the Sugarloaf? The Sugarloaf is this big peak that's about 1300 feet tall. And we have a beach right next to it. It's called the Red Beach because of the color of the sand. It's a uh, kind of orangey red, right? Very. Uh, brighter and stronger of color than the other beaches that are usually white sand. And so what is the attraction here? These two mountains that you go up by cable car. So you go up this first hill, which is Urca Hill, and then you go up the second hill, which is the Sugarloaf Mountain. So let's quickly see what the cable car ride looks like. There is the cable car. It uh, fits up to 65 people on a normal basis. And it was one of the first cable cars installed in the world. It's over 100 years old. It's a very modern system. It's one of the most modern cable cars in, in, the, in the world. So this is the first ride up. You already have quite a good view. Look at this view here of the Guanabara Bay. We do have a helicopter pad here in the first hill. It's called the Urca Hill. This is the domestic airport here, the Santos Dumont Airport. And then our next stop is this big mountain here. Some people do rock climbing here, actually. So there we are going up to 1,300 feet. And this is the view you get from the top. You get to see the Christ and all these amazing mountains we talked about. There's the Copacabana Beach. That's one of the best views of the beach from the top. This is the Red Beach, it's quite small here. So this is open ocean and on the other side is inside the bay. And sometimes you get to see this other monkey, which is the marmoset. So the marmoset is the smallest species of monkey in the world and you get to see it here in Rio. And it's also a great spot for pictures like this one and also a great spot for sunsets. So it's very, very popular. Look at how crowded it gets. This was before the pandemic as well. This was uh, shot from my phone. So last but not least, I'm sure everyone is uh, waiting to see this. <laughs> Christ the Redeemer. So the most popular way to get up there, one of the only ones is the train. So the train itself is quite an attraction because we are going in the forest. Let's see if I can. Start it over. No. All right. So we get some views from the train. The train takes about 20 minutes. And we are actually inside the National Park when we go to the Christ. We are inside the forest. So it's really quite a ride. It's very beautiful. One of my favorite things to do in Rio. And this is the view you get from the top right in front of the Christ. There's the Sugarloaf. There is the Atlantic Ocean. And here comes the statue. <laughs> there he is. 
So the Christ the Redeemer statue is one of the biggest Christ statues in the world, not the biggest one anymore because some other countries have done bigger ones, but it is 125 feet tall and sits on top of this mountain where we are, which is the Corcovado mountain that's 2300 feet. So I think I said 2300 feet for Sugarloaf, but that was wrong. It's 1300 feet. So the, the Christ statue is 89 years old. And this is one of the best ways to see the statue and the city. So I strongly recommend when you come to Rio to do a helicopter tour. And this is the view. So I'll leave you with the view a little bit. There's Copacabana Beach in the back now. And this is where we get to see why the mountain is called Corcovado. It means hunchback. And here is the hunch, the hump. We have the beautiful forest covering the mountains, the lagoon there, right to the right of the Christ now. And now we get to see the mountains and the national park in the back. So with that, I wanted to thank you so much. Thank you everyone that's been watching. Now we can uh, get some more questions. But before that, I wanted to leave you with some of my contacts here. You have my phone or WhatsApp or iMessage. As I said in the beginning, you can reach me via Instagram, Facebook, or email. If you would like to contribute, uh, as we talked about before, tourism is not going very well here in Brazil. So feel free to use the PayPal QR code or the email for the PayPal contributions if you'd like to. They are very, very welcome and I greatly appreciate them. I'm going to leave also these uh, details in the chat for you so, we can, uh, so I can stop sharing and uh, start talking to you again. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? I know I have really appreciated you showing the maps and so we could see how things related to each other. So I really appreciated that. Um, any other noteworthy buildings to visit? So many. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Rio has been uh, announced to be now the first world capital of architecture. We were supposed to have the um, World Congress of Architecture this year. And it's now going to be uh, in 2021. So we do have very, very different buildings that are worthy to visit. Many churches that are covered in gold on the inside, especially downtown. We have the Metropolitan Cathedral that is quite a modern building, very different from any other cathedral around the world. Uh, fortunately, as Laura said, and as I said to her, it's not fair to talk about Rio in only an hour is not enough. <laughs> uh, there's so much to see and so much to do in Rio, but the cathedral is definitely worth a visit. Um, we do have many different kinds of architecture and buildings around, so those are some of them. Let's see. Very interesting. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for your feedback. Someone seen the Cobra Graffiti in New York City? Yes, that's not the only one actually. There's one of the the kiss, that kiss, that's the picture that's famous at the end of uh, World War II, right? I think it's still there. <laughs> There's some in Miami actually, in that graffiti area of Miami, he has some there as well. So I left my contacts here um, in the chat. The kiss was the one I was talking about. Oh, so it's still there. Good to know. <laughs> yeah, it's made by Cobra. So that's really cool. He also has one in the Anne Frank Museum by the Anne Frank Museum in Amsterdam, which is really cool. It's very popular. Let me see who else has something. That's all I see. Yeah. <laughs> Someone asked if, this, if it was flamingo. I don't know if what was this referring to. It was right when you were starting the um, the carnival. Oh, okay. That's probably samba. Samba, right? Samba, yes. 
Can you talk about safety and how to see experience in the city in an authentic way? Uh, yes, so unfortunately, the international media is very negative towards Rio and only shows the problems. And as any big city, we have many problems. And it's just a matter of being aware of your surroundings and um, mainly, you know, hiring a local person, walking around with a local person is one of the best things to do. Uh, but as I said, the south part of the city where we have Copacabana and Ipanema are the most touristic areas and are where most of the hotels are located. So uh, we have a lot of tourist police around these areas, but it's, you know, general rules of traveling, you know, not going in small alleys at night, not walking around with big chunks of money or gold chains or Rolex, something like this, you know, nothing to catch attention to yourself. You know, the people who want to do harm, they can, you know, eye a tourist from far, they know if you're a tourist. Well, not all the time, because sometimes I get, uh, I get uh, people telling me that I'm a tourist here and start speaking with me in English on the streets. <laughs> uh, but you know, this is something very cool about, about Brazil. It's such a multicultural country that anyone can look Brazilian. But most of the times, if you're looking a little lost, they know you're a tourist. So it's always a good idea to just stay in the main um, areas, stay in the main avenues. And the best would be to, to walk with a local person uh, something that most people do when they come to Rio is do the tour, the classical tour of one day in Rio where you hit the main highlights. Well, some of them, right? Because there's so many to see. But the highlights like Christ and Sugarloaf and the stadium, Maracanã, the Samba Drum, all of these that you see uh, on a one day, eight hour tour. And then if you want to do more tours, usually uh, people hire a private tour guide, which is what we do. So someone was asking about which football club I support. I usually don't watch soccer like Flamengo. I only, I only watch soccer in the World Cup, uh, but I really do like watching the World Cup. But other than that, yes, Flamengo is the team in Brazil, uh, the, the largest soccer team here in Brazil, and the team with the largest fan base in Brazil if I'm not mistaken, there's over 40 million people in Brazil that root for Flamengo, which is the name of the soccer team. So yes, as I said, very, <laughs> someone said Corinthians, <laughs> that's a Sao Paulo team. Uh, people are very, very passionate about soccer here and they fight and they argue and, you know, it cut relations with family members. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not much into that. So I just watch soccer when Brazil plays. <laughs> Aline, thank you so much. What a pleasant evening this has been. Um, thank, you. thank you guys for joining us. I hope to see you again at an upcoming virtual event or hopefully soon in person. Um, and to everybody, thank you so much and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'll be available in my contacts if you want to ask any more questions yeah. or I'm available for the Dickinson community always. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. <laughs> Have a good bye. evening. Obrigado. Obrigada. Thank you. <laughs> ciao, ciao. Ciao. Thank you, Laura. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I was. If anyone else was uh, writing anything in the chat, but it was just thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> and I was. I know you want to do the picture at the end, but so many people didn't have it showing. I took one yeah. picture during where there were maybe six or seven people. I'll send it to you. But yes. <laughs> um, people didn't have their screens on, and by the end it had dwindled down. So I, I knew you wanted to do that, but I wasn't sure people were. Gonna turn okay. at that point. Yeah, I saw that most people just stayed with their camera off. So that's yeah, and yeah. But I did snap one. I'll I'll shoot it to you. Oh, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. <laughs>